We love supporting and promoting the creators of musical theater throughout the world. And we would love to have your support as well. Go to musicaltheaterradio.com and click on the Become a Patron button because a supportive community is a strong community. Good day, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Be Our Guest here on Musical Theater Radio. I am your host, as always, Jean-Paul Yovanoff. Well, today we are talking to someone from the future. Uh, 15 hours to be precise, where it is already tomorrow. Uh, we are heading down under to Australia for our next guest, and uh, I've been talking off air, and I'm enjoying the conversations already. We are going to be talking with performer and writer Bradley McCaw. Bradley, thank you so much for coming on. Hello from the future, Jean-Paul. <laughs> it's, it sounds so different up there in the future. I have oh. a message from your future self. Oh, no. It oh, has I... these lotto numbers for you. Oh, 73, I... <laughs> 72, 81. No, that's not true. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thanks yeah. for having me on the show. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you for coming on. So I always start every interview with a nice, simple thing. I ask for a 30-second bio. So who is Bradley in 30 seconds? All right. Um... So this is obviously also going to go on my dating app profile. So I appreciate you for organizing a two in one. No problem. Uh, um, who is Bradley McCall? Wow. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like you said in the intro, I'm, I'm a, a performer turn, turn writer is kind of the best way to, to summarize it. I started as a singer, as an, an, an actor that played piano and, and got a phone call kind of, 10 years into my career asking me to write a musical, like literally someone asked me to write a musical mm. and that was what then turned into what was my first production. And, uh, and ever since then I have been, you know, donning both hats of being a writer and performer and, and, um, and now a bit of a historian. Like I just love, uh, you know, I love the art form and, mm. and, um, and that's why it's always great to, to come on shows like this is because we all are at the, at the very core, big, big theater nerds really <laughs> so yeah that's kind of that's kind of who i am in a, a professional setting but i also love ducks and um and chocolate i guess uh that's gonna work perfect on the dating profile great <laughs> <laughs> ducks and chocolate and a performer what person is not gonna want to be attracted to that right <laughs> i gotta be honest i feel like mentioning ducks on a profile is probably not a, the best <laughs> thing to do. it sounds very odd now that i've said it out loud doesn't it it sounds of all the animals you could mention a duck is probably one of the weirder ones i guess yeah. Not I. There are weirder animals to mention. I think on you're a right. Actually, profile. you're right. Yeah. You're right. I've steered us down a very strange barnyard path here. I think. It's okay. I. You know what? I'd like to say this is the first time we've talked about barnyard animals, but. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, but, gosh. Okay, well, this took a right-hand turn real fast, but that's okay. <laughs> that's what that's what this is all about. So let let me take it back right to the beginning uh, for okay. you. When when you were growing up, were you always into musical theater, or is that something that kind of grew on you as you as you grow up? Grew up. Uh, I would say that it was something that I found later in my career i mean i started really late in music anyway i started when i was probably about 15 wow. is when i really even started studying music we, i didn't really listen to music growing up we didn't come from a, a sort of a an upbringing that had time for music as strange as that sort of sounds to say and so uh, I, it really was one of the first musics that i heard but um it feels to say that i came to it quite late if that makes sense because i was you know almost reaching my twenties, you know, when I heard wow. Joseph and his Technicolor dream coat and, and Jesus Christ soup stuff for the first time and then into the woods. And, and then from then it just became, you know, a, a deep love affair really. Wow. So what did you want to do as you were growing up? You know, you weren't sure if you wanted to be a performer, obviously when you were younger, is there something else you wanted to do? I didn't, I never really thought about it to be perfectly honest. I never, I mean, the first time that I thought about it was probably at about 15 from memory where I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, but as my mother reminded me, I was far too dumb to be a lawyer. <laughs> uh, and not that I was too dumb, just at the time I didn't really read much. I wasn't much of a thinking person, you know, and that really came later in life as I started to, to want to be a writer. You know, I became ferocious in what I would read and, you know, have a small library now from just collecting. And mm -hmm. it's crazy to think that I've come from, from a guy that 
you know, just didn't, didn't enjoy words or, or music at all to where yeah. I am now. It's kind of, it's amazing. Do you remember the turning point that, that maybe that song or that moment that went, Hey, I kind of want to do this. I remember listening to like a lot of us, the, the original Broadway cast recording of Rent. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember that really being, there was something in that story, in that score, in, in the yearning, uh, in it that kind of really resonated in me and really spoke to me that I guess I, I had uh, the thought then that this is something that I could do forever. I don't think I knew what that meant. I mean, none of us know that that means being, you know, <laughs> stuck in a room for most of the day on your own, uh, you know, which is kind of the opposite of what rent is talking about. Yeah. Interestingly. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think that was probably the moment I used to get this, uh, this, this bus to school. Um, I'm sure a lot of people can relate to, you know, that when you got your old, uh, I had the walk Walkman at the time and, mm -hmm. you know, I had, you know, disc one of rent and, and I probably had <laughs> disc two stash somewhere, you know, ready to put it on. And I used to sing it on the bus and then get off the bus and sing it as I walked home, just loudly, loud and proud. I'd be singing, you know, don't breathe too deep, you know, at the top of my lungs. <laughs> And I'm sure people used to think I was mental. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, but look at me now. Uh, yeah, that's right. You, you go back you. on that bus and you find those people and you tell them. I do every day. Nice. I get on that bus. Uh, not by choice, but <laughs> by uh, legally mandated. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, uh, it's probably rent. To answer your question, okay. to circle back around, I would say, I'd say it was rent. That oh, was really yeah. Rent is that I, I consider Rent one of those gateway musicals, like like Phantom and Hamilton, uh, that you, you draw in this the the regular person and then they explore out from there. It's it's that one that gets you into musical theater. It's, I think it's one of those. Yeah, and I kind of come from. Um, I know one of the three questions that you ask us later is being a listener, and so I'm not going to ruin it. <laughs> okay. But 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 my answer is probably the wrong one. Um, <laughs> is, is, you know, is that uh, I kind of don't think that there's for me anything wrong with something kind of being big and appealing, mm -hmm. because that for a lot of us is how we find things until we stumble into things with more intricacy and we have the time to really understand something that takes a lot more time to really pick apart, you know? Yeah. So I think that's why rent, you know, sometimes people will say, and I'm just talking randomly here, you know, in, in yeah. us having a big broad conversation, but they have, you know, sometimes people say, oh, rent isn't perfect. And I would change this dramaturgically mm -hmm. and I would do this if, and they would have, if, you know, if it wasn't for the tragic passing of, of Jonathan Lars and all that, those sort of stuff. But there's something that's in it that really is perfect in its imperfection, mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah. that exists outside of it. And I think that's what, you know, speaks to a lot of people. So if, if you buffed out all the, all of the, you know, all the little cracks, would it lose its shine? You know, that's something that I really, really feel sometimes. So I think um, not to steer the conversation in another way. <laughs> I, I, I think it is one of those shows that really does um, call to us because of something what's deeper in the cracks, you know, mm -hmm. what's right in there. I always wonder, cause I know rent one, uh, I think the Pulitzer, at that in mm. 94 or five or whatever it was. Um, and then now, you know, people are noticing those cracks and things like that. I'm always wondering, is that going to happen to shows like Dear Evan Hansen in Hamilton when you give it 20 years out? Um, I, I'm just curious. Like, I don't know how you're from the future. You would know better than I would. Um, I mean, here in the future, we've already declared Hamilton a complete disaster. Nice. Um, I did not so, know. So wow. You've only got about another 24 hours to enjoy it. Uh, okay. <laughs> I've seen it already, so I'm good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the hottest take uh, of the day. Um, but that's not true. That's not true. I take it back. Uh, please let me stay in the community, please. Hey, um, I, I, you're good by me. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So. I, 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 don't, I don't know. I think if anything, if you put it under a, a strong enough microscope, it can't be yeah. perfect. I mean, it's art. How can, how can, I don't, look, I don't know. I'm an early career artist. You know, I've had <laughs> one production presented professionally in Australia and I've got, whole bunch in development um uh, I, I love the art form and study the art form as you know and and so much of it seems opinion based as well because sure. what you believe what you see the show to mean means you take on another view of what the structure is of how it hangs together what the point is 
you know, there's philosophical conversations mm-hmm. that open up the purpose of something. I, I don't know. It's hard to say, isn't it? Whether in 20 years something will, I mean, it depends what happening, what's happening culturally in 20 years too. Oh, it might be sure. like, we don't sing about guys named Evan anymore. That's just not done. <laughs> yeah. It could happen. Who knows? <laughs> you know, who knows what's going to happen in 20 years. So yeah. Well, I know Dear Evan Hansen is it's already, and I'm going to get in trouble for this, is already. Oh, here we go. We've, 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 I've let us down a, <laughs> down, a, down a complicated path. That's okay. But I th- it's already outdated in some of the references because they they talk about Facebook and things like that. Five yeah. years from now, that may mean absolutely nothing. And, and, it, and it's, it might as well be Oklahoma or something like that because it is already becoming outdated, um, which I mm. find interesting. But, but will like in the same way that older shows kind of have become this kind of time capsule, and mm-hmm. then when we go to see them and when we put them on, we're kind of doing it in a way that is celebrating that time as sure. well, or 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 highlighting things that challenge conversation about that time, yes. or all those sort of you know many different colors to that fabric of why we would do it. But I wonder if that show particularly, I don't know, will, will, I'm just talking here, yeah. could become the same thing of the time of social media will go, do you remember that time? Because I mean, yeah. no one is not touched by that now, surely. There can't be anyone on the planet that doesn't remember or have an interaction with Facebook, surely. Yeah. Surely. It, it's it's it going to be interesting. Well, again, this is all about going wherever we want to go. How, what's your opinion on uh, shows getting changed because they don't necessarily conform to the uh, the way society is today? Because there's a lot of shows from 60, 70, 80 years ago have messages that aren't necessarily compatible with today's messages, but you know what? They were a product of their time. It's tough, isn't it? I don't know what the answer is to that because I, look, who am I to even pretend that I have an ultimate answer to that? I don't. I'm just, you know, a guy in the future that, you know, (laughs) uh, I don't know. How do I feel about that person? Yeah, it's more of an opinion question. I don't know. uh, The writer in me sort of says, I mean, if, if something is tragically misplaced for the time, (laughs) then it probably won't be put on probably. Mm-hmm. I don't know. There must be things that are just ironed out through time um, that we don't remember that, that maybe don't have any relevance anymore, but things that, I mean, okay, here, here's a, here's a sub question. Are we doing yeah. it to be able to continue marketing those things? Are we doing it because there is still some uh, money to be made from that property, but we need it to be more palatable? Is that, is that the way that we put it? Or is it that we love the work, but we want it to be more relevant now? Or is it like that? I think all of those are the questions. And I guess if it's coming from a good intent, then I guess it's not right. If the writer is no longer with us though, that opens up a different thing for me personally, because yeah. I just, I just think maybe we should leave that where they kind of finished up for all its imperfection. Because once again, it's a piece of time. It's a piece of history. And we've got very clever people that are always going to keep recreating. I mean, 30 years ago, if someone said Hamilton was going to come along, mm-hmm. I doubt that anyone would, someone would go, that's never going to make any money. Yeah. You know, like, can you, can you imagine? Um, so that, that's probably my very wide and possibly too safe answer. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I like to play it sometimes not safe. Like, I believe that the art is the way it was and, the artist, if the artist is not around to change it, don't change it. There's like, mm. why change something? Why whitewash it and, and get rid of something if we won't learn from it, right? This is the way it was. Let the yeah. artist live the way it is. Whereas company, you know, how they, in England, they did the incredible switch for company where they made the male parts female and the female parts male, but they went through Sondheim to do that. And that's completely yeah. different where you actually working with the person who wrote it. Like don't change art because you don't like it. It is, you know, then why even bother? I don't know. Uh, it's, We're pretty it's, fortunate to live in a time where that can happen too, that we get, yeah. you know, these incredible new works from some time. And then we live in a time where we can then see him be a part of yes. those works, having another life. Like how yep. lucky are we as an audience to be able to go and see another company and be surprised mm-hmm. in yep. a totally new way. So yep. 
Yeah, it's, uh, look, who knows? Hey, if we just have something to see on a Friday night that <laughs> makes us laugh and cry, I mean, we're kind of winning. Exactly. So. Just, just, and that's why I always say about reviews and people going, oh, I like this, I don't like that. I'm like, fine, have your opinion. Don't, don't have to like mine. Just go see it. Just go yeah. support the arts. You know, whether you think it's good or bad or somebody else said it was good or bad. So now that we've gone off on a huge tangent, <laughs> let's get back to you because it's all about cool. you. So oh, you're, you're, <laughs> you're, you're 15, you're, you're discovered music and things like that. You, now you say you went into singing, right? And, and that's where yeah, that was, what yeah, that was how I started. Uh, so I have, look, in a nutshell, I, um, I have kind of done everything um, <laughs> to, to, this, to this point. Um, at the moment, I have a, a, a headline show that does the cruise ships, so that does, you know, travels the world, playing all different places. Um, and that's me, you know, uh, leading a large band and, and, and singing and, Very cool. um, and yeah, it's, um, it's, it's pretty special at times to see these amazing places and, and, and do that sort of thing. And, and being on the sea in the middle of the night when there is nothing you, you can see 360 is really quite incredible. Um, but that, that, that show has been developed through a whole multitude of things, you know, playing in bands, original bands when I was, you know, coming up as a singer songwriter. And um, even, in, in fact, my writing kind of took another step when I was in rent, I was in the Queensland premier uh, <laughs> cast. So Queensland is like a state in Australia. Yes. Okay. So, so I was in the Queensland premier, interestingly of rent and tick, tick, boom uh, <laughs> in my, in my state. So I ticked those two little bucket list items as a young man, wow. but um but that was when I kind of first started jamming with a band in Rent. So there's a quick mm -hmm. sort of little side story, but um, yeah. Does that, does that answer your question? It does. Cause you went on to become singer. You went on to cruise ships and from the sounds of it. And, and then how did you get into writing uh, some musicals? I mean, you know, I, I should say, Joe Paul, I kind of also too sidetracked. I, I, as a classical singer, I was, I sung with a singing group, the 10 tenors and traveled the world singing with them. Wow. Um, and I've done a whole bunch of other things just as a, just as a, a working singer in between. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the main focus for the past 10 years during all of these different things has been behind closed doors, developing my skills as a writer because I yeah. came to it so late. It wasn't like a, you know, a young person that kind of goes, I'm going to be a writer and that's what I'm going to do. And mm -hmm. by the time you're 20, you've been doing it for 10 years. I was 25 starting yeah. out, you know, it's, it's been an interesting journey. Nice. Well, congratulations first on being able to live off your craft <laughs> and traveling yeah, the world. Yeah. That that unto itself is, you know, fantastic. We all It's wish not bad. That. It's not bad, yeah. especially when you're in the middle of nowhere like Australia. <laughs> <laughs> you need to get on the cruise ship to get anywhere. And, and... You got to get out of there, yeah. <laughs> well, where did the cruise ships take you just on a on a side note? How where did where did you travel? Uh, I've been, gosh, uh, to Vietnam about five times now, Japan, China, Hawaii, Tahiti, around my homeland, Australia, a couple of times, all of the islands nearby. Um, I've been to so many, so many places. Pretty much there's this volcanic equator, I believe is what it's called, which, which travels from Australia up around through, you know, the borders of, of Japan and China and, uh, and there's obviously volcanic spots all along through that, that area. And that's why it's called that. And, um, and I've traveled kind of that entire mass up and down kind of all around through there. Very nice. If anyone has uh, their Atlas open, <laughs> you'll be able to also learn something geographically from today's conversation. Fine. And that's what, uh, this is what I'm all about learning about geography. If, mm. if that's, that's why I started the radio station. Uh, so, mm. so people could learn about, geography um, like <laughs> like i want to go to australia it's, it is on my list actually my girlfriend really wants to go to australia i'm not sure why because she's hates spiders so well they will kill her here like I they know. will sense her fear and find her <laughs> like there's a show on netflix all about like the 72 deadliest animals in australia and she won't even watch that i'm like if you can't watch it how are we going to go there so. See, one of the untold stories of Australia is our population is actually about 8 billion, 
but <laughs> people are killed every day from spiders and animals and snakes. And that's what keeps us down to such a small population. So I'm glad we're learning so much, so much <laughs> about Australia and geography yeah. here yeah. today. Or terrible. I'm going to get a call from like the national tourism office or something tomorrow. <laughs> They'll be like, what is going on? <laughs> I know they're listening. I know they are. <laughs> so. Yeah, they, they love musical theatre. <laughs> Actually, have you seen our new, as another little, another strange segue, have you seen our new ad um, written no. by Eddie Perfect, composer of Beetlejuice and King Kong? And, no, um, I haven't seen it. And featuring Carly Minogue. It was written just for the Brits. So I don't, you can Google it uh, if you want to find it. Okay. I think it's called G'day from Your Mate in Australia. And it's all... <laughs> It's all so our tourism board. It's actually a big musical theatre song. So wow. we were joking that they don't like musical theatre, but we, you know, we've put a lot of money into trying to do that. Anyway, that, so you can go and check that out. That's that's probably all I need to say about that. <laughs> well, you've you've made us all want to go there with your eight billion people stories and your deadly <laughs> animals. <laughs> so okay, so what was the first show you worked on when you, when you started writing? Um, that would be my first musical that's just been we just had our australian premiere um production just what last year now which was called uh thank you very much yeah it was it's incredible it was cool it's called becoming bill cool and, and tell us um, a little bit about it so becoming bill is uh semi-autobiographical in that uh and wait for it <laughs> it's about a young man who gets a call asking him to write a musical <laughs> out of the blue and he bases it on his life and he bases it as all new writers do about on themselves and he bases yeah. it on him and his mom and his girlfriend at the time that's on and off and 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 they're they're terribly well uh, made for each other as you can tell <laughs> and then his brother who won't get off the couch and so when he bases the story on himself and on his life and as he starts to pick apart the threads that were loosely holding them together um he kind of picks apart himself and, and, and learns that he's probably not as well kept together as he thinks he is. And that if he, the show kind of becomes a force of change for him and those around him. Um, so it's, yeah, it's semi biographical and uh, it's, it's been a labor of love because it took 10 years to get from what was this very early draft that I wrote for a company here in Australia when I was asked to write a musical. Mm -hmm. It, it, it took a long time as a guy that didn't know how to write a story to convert these songs that he'd written through passion and just from the sheer love of the art form. I just wrote these kind of 10 songs and put them on at this concert. And the end of this concert, we got a standing ovation. Everyone stood up wow. and people were crying. And it's because I'd just written these songs that were about true relationships and about kind of being honest about something mm -hmm. and they're all very simple and all quite basic in a lot of ways you know in their themes and things like that it's not very complicated but it tugs at something underneath and i think it's because i didn't know what i was doing yeah that it was just really honest and so it took 10 years to kind of work out how to turn that into a story that didn't lose the essence of those things and that's been the biggest challenge in not trying to make the show too complicated and, and too big and to let it just speak about this family that's trying to find a way to be able to talk to each other. And that's really what it's about. It's just about all of us trying to be able to communicate, which is really at the heart, a really difficult thing to talk about anyway in a show, because it's not really about anything mm -hmm. when you talk about what to talk about, you know? Uh, so it's a bit company-ish in that way, you know, it explores those kind of themes about, you know, having to grow up and, and that sort of thing. But it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's been really well received and people have really, really gotten a lot out of it. And, and we're talking to some parties around the world now about doing different things. And so, great. you know, it's, it's, it's an exciting time to, to be ready to take the show, hopefully to Canada. I, I would love for that. I would, I would yeah. be one of the first in line. If, and yeah, I would be there and I would promote the hell out of it for you. Definitely. That'd be the plan. That'd be great. So, so what, when you're writing the, when you were writing that first show, what, what did you find it difficult to write the songs? Like, are you a lyricist first, the composer next or a combination of both or which do you find easier? So for this project, I wrote uh, the, the music, the lyrics and the book. Okay. Um, and which is quite common, I guess, for a first time writer that yeah. starts out, especially in the middle of nowhere, like Australia, like we're not in the middle of nowhere, but we're so far away and yes. you know, there's less collaborators and all sorts of things like that. 
Um, but I, so I started the entire project kind of just sitting at the piano and kind of thinking about something and then just letting it pour out and then taking that kind of base piece of, you know, wood or whatever that this bit of clay and then having to sort of mm -hmm. shape it into something that was, you know, nice to look at. Um, so it, to answer your question, I was all things, but all things kind of bit by bit by bit by bit. Yeah. Um, today I work very differently, you know, after, you know, years of developing, you know, a process at the time yeah. I didn't have a process. I just, you know, yeah. What you don't know, you don't know to not to do or anything like that. Right. The first one, exactly. You just go in by the seat of your pants and whatever happens happens. And it's always the second one. That's a little bit harder because like I did the same thing. My first musical was based on a lot of my own life. So I, yeah. I could do that. The next one, you've already done your life, unless you're going to do a sequel or the second half of your life, you got to explore something new. Did you find that uh, a little bit difficult when you moved on to your second show? I think that's, yeah, it, uh, this is when we kind of start to discover at least dramaturgically that this is where stakes are really important, right? Mm -hmm. Because something that we think is kind of has a bit of stakes doesn't have stakes for anyone else, you know, and the, the dramatic principle of something isn't big enough. And I think to find something then that really resonates to a lot of people in an interesting and new, you know, unique way. I think that's the, that is one of the, the troubles in the beginning. Um, and yeah, you, you have to learn to identify with whoever you're singing about, isn't it? Previously, yeah. you had a direct line to that. You're like, yeah, it's me or it's my mm -hmm. girlfriend or it's my boyfriend or it's my mom or my brother or whatever. Yeah. But you're right. When we start our second one, it's like, who is Barry and why does he own a flower <laughs> shop in Missouri? You know, exactly. and, and, and how did he get there? Why did he buy this with his dad's <laughs> insurance money over everything else? You know, and why does a thousand people want to hear about Barry and his flower shop? Like that becomes the problem, isn't it? Um, and it's a lot more cerebral, I think, too, at that yeah. point, which is then you've got to get out of that as well and just kind of try and, you know, yeah. have a balance. Now I am curious about Barry in the flower shop. I mean, that's what a good story does, doesn't it? <laughs> 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 and that's, that, that's really interesting because all we did was it, was it was like three or four things. And if you get simple key details, yeah. you want to know more. Exactly. I didn't even... I mean, I did, there is mystery in why he used his dad's insurance money. Like, did he kill him? Is that, yeah. is that what you thought? Is that what, is that what uh, you thought? I don't know. I'm intrigued. I'm not sure anymore. That says a lot about you, Jean-Paul, that you, you yeah. leapt to that conclusion. Yes. You know, Barry is just an honest man. You know, no. he's not. Then you know, I can't I'm relate. I'm lost in my own <laughs> <laughs> reverie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Excuse man. me. No worries. So, uh, so you've, you've got Becoming Bill. Was that actually the plot of your second show? Of Barry and his <laughs> no, no, it's the plot of Damn. my new one. Uh, yeah, um, writers everywhere are scrambling to copyright that exactly. idea. <laughs> uh, no, the plot of the second one that I started working on, I kind of started working on a whole bunch of things while I was developing Becoming Bill because I just needed to kind of get deeper into understanding story. I, yeah. I, because the show. It couldn't be solved by just expanding the stakes. What had to be expanded was the the relationships and what they were discussing and how they were discussing to keep the kind of drama moving along in a really simple way. And I just had no idea how to do that because I didn't even know that's what I needed to do. Yeah. So I had to. So I started. Um, you know, I I did that old trick uh, in the um, the one that Sondheim talks about being given um, the the three show uh, exercise. You know that story? Do you know the, the uh, one where he was given in his early days when he oh, was... Oh, um, yeah, when he was talking with uh, Hammerstein? That's it, Hammerstein. Yeah. And, 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 and uh, he said, I want you to write three shows, or maybe it's four. I can't remember correctly. But I, at the time, I, I when I read four, that... But yeah. It was four. One, what, was, what were they? Can you remember? Uh, oh, I talked about it but like a year ago. I think one was based on a short story. One was yeah. based on a play. Another one was an yeah. original idea. And... I, I the fourth was about Barry and, and the yeah, Missouri Barry and Missouri shop. in a flower shop. Yes, yeah. Dan Sondheim already took it. Yeah, bastard. And that became Little Shop of Horrors. <laughs> it's, it's weird how that works. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody saw that coming. <laughs> so when I started, <clears throat> excuse me, pardon me. Um, when I started that exercise, I started a bunch of different shows, and one was, um yeah an adaptation of a little princess that i've been working on like mm -hmm. a different one i know there's the lipper one that's out there but um and yeah so that's why i have a collection of stuff now that's yeah. kind of almost complete um 
which is it's exciting. Well, like you said, you've been working on uh, becoming Bill for ten years. You're gonna find uh, some other ideas pop into your head that you wanna you wanna work on, right? So it makes sense. And I'm looking at your website, and you wrote plays as well. You've written a number of plays. You've scored some films and things like that. So you've been keeping yourself busy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's true because it, often I think when people say to me during the kind of the whole press part of doing uh, the Australian production of Becoming Bill, there was a lot of questions that were like, so how did you, people were amazed and dumbfounded that you can stick with something for 10 years and actually in case it might not follow through. Like we forget as writers that we kind of at somewhere make a choice that we don't have a choice anymore, that we just have to see it through. Yep. And other people go, but why would you do that? Like, you know, like I won't even stick with, you know, some people leave an intermission because they don't want to waste the next hour and a half, hour and a half on a show that they don't want to finish, you know? Yeah. And we're spending 10 years on something that may not be any good. People can't <laughs> believe that, you know? I think we've just got a different kind of, I don't know, mindset or the way we work as artists. Yeah. Where, you know, time is, you know, irrelevant sometimes. It just, you know, you do it until it's I done. think that's really it. Time is irrelevant. That's so true. Yeah. So. And, I, and I guess you don't just spend all your time on that, I think is where I was going to. You don't yeah. just spend all your time on that one show. You develop other things, like you said, other plays, um, other short film scores, other, other projects that fuel you, your, you creatively. And because and, 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 it's also a hobby, I guess. So you kind of just, mm -hmm. you know, fill your cup, really. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fantastic. You've done all this stuff. And so going back to Becoming Bill, so it, it got on in, in Australia. And, and mm -hmm. it, where else has it been? Has it gone anywhere else? There, there's, been, uh, there's been potential for other things previously that didn't sort of come to fruition that I don't want to mention that were like festival uh, admissions and things like that that we didn't end up taking because in mm -hmm. Australia, it is such a long way for sure to bring a show. And when you, when you do kind of journey... I mean, it's the same as Canada in a way. There's a lot of people, I'm sure. Uh, it's much closer to kind of the epicenter of, you know, yes. you know New York and, 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 and London. But yes. you still have to be really ready to take a show from your hometown to kind of the next sort of big opportunity where a show can be re revealed to more people and, and have yeah. more opportunity, you know. And, and so that's kind of where we're at now. Um, uh, which is, yeah, it's, it's an exciting story to watch unfold, you know, very uh, cool being in it. Yeah. Well, no, that's, you know what you've, you've done something that a lot of people are still trying to do. You've, you've got your show mounted and, and, mm -hmm. and noticed and, and there are many people out there who haven't even got to that point. So kudos to you. And, and yeah, it's so true. And it's, it's important to remember that, isn't it? Like that we can all, um, it's a very long and kind of strange road. And it yeah. seems to take very different passes for, for all of our stories. It's really, it's really yeah. amazing. Because sometimes we feel, you know, I know I, I have, I've, I've only written a couple of shows, uh, you know, and I've got a few in the pipeline and I think, oh, I've done nothing. But then you got to remember, there are so many people who have not done even that, you know, they haven't even been able to get their show on and, you know, they're still struggling. So I, I got to remember sometimes that I've been lucky and blessed that I have had my show produced and, and put up and, and that sort and, of thing. And with what we're doing, particularly in musical theatre, it doesn't take just, you know, if you were a painter that was going mm -hmm. to develop the craft of painting, yes. you would paint and you would do that the first time and then the second time and then the third time and the fourth time, fifth time. And you would do that sequentially until you built up such an arsenal of skills that you yep. would be able to paint a painting really well. But for us, that first painting, which is a musical, requires obviously about 20 songs, <laughs> a whole bunch of yep. understanding, all different art forms. Not yeah. just one. Now, I'm not comparing painting to us and saying it's a competition. I'm not. Van Gogh was really <laughs> clever. I'm not saying anything. Pollock's a genius. That's fine. Yeah. But all I'm saying is that, too, we have to remember is that one painting for us <laughs> takes a long time. It's so true. And then to get it on yeah. stage is an even longer thing. So yeah. you're right. It, it, this journey is, I mean, first of all, it's madness. And second of yeah, all, I know. What are we thinking? madness. So, I mean... <laughs> But we love it. And, you know, yeah. other people do too. So yeah. We're very lucky to be a part of the tradition, I think. I, I believe so too. So down there, you're, you're, you live in Australia. What part of Australia are you in? I'm in Queensland. 
Okay. So Queensland is um, the the sunny state. It's the place that has incredible weather. We have incredible incredible beaches. Nice. Um, we have lots of incredible spiders, uh, sharks, <laughs> snakes. We have all sorts of things. Um, but yeah, we've got a. It's we're a kind of a smaller town kind of environment in Queensland because we're we're one of the smaller cities in in the country, mm -hmm. um, on the on the eastern sort of side. How many people? Are in it's the a city? beautiful place. Oh gosh, I you know I looked this up the other day. I want to say four four million, but I, I don't know if I'm remembering correctly. It's um, I'd have to Google it. Okay, that's not that small. Four million is a pretty good number. For, yeah, it's definitely city. a bigger city, but it doesn't yeah. feel like when you go to Sydney or Melbourne, which are also you know yeah. Australian cities, and they're more of our major cities. You definitely yeah. you you become aware that it's just the it's just you know it's it's like different places yeah. anywhere. Everyone has a a different personality, a different way of doing things, for and sure. here we definitely have a, a slight laziness about us. Maybe <laughs> laziness is the right word. We have a slight laid back, slower kind of. I mean, you know, what's the classic Australian thing? No worries. This is what yeah. we say. And this, this um, amazes people everywhere else around the world because if you're actually saying to someone, no worries, it kind of implies that there is a worry. Otherwise, you wouldn't need to say no worries. <laughs> it's so it's kind of like we're relaxed, but kind of super uptight about being relaxed. I don't understand. It's, sort of, it's like, yeah, that's cool. No worries. It's like, well, really? Um, so that's kind of what Queensland's all about in a nutshell, I guess. And hey, what's, what's the uh, musical scene look like there? The musical theater scene? Is, is there a big one or is there you? And uh, well, there's a, no, we, have a, we have a really, really um, great tradition in Australia. Like it goes um, way back um, and is really storied and has uh, so many incredible writers that have, you know, lifted and, and done their part to really try and grow our understanding of how to write here. I mean, you know, we're a long way away and that's been, I think, the biggest challenge for Australia is to kind of, you know, no one sort of, you know, uh, you know, had a hit on Broadway and go, you know what, I'm going to go to Australia and write a show. You know, it's, we don't have kind of anyone that's coming over that's bringing all the, 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 the way to do things and helping yeah. us to learn in that. So we've had to kind of develop our own thing there. So, but um, we have, we kind of have, uh, so if, you, if, if you're listening and you're familiar with kind of the American touring market, if you mm -hmm. just think of that, yeah. That is kind of our main market here. If okay. you think of it, that's probably the best way. We've got major cities and we've got shows that tour to each major city. And that's kind of how it works. No one goes to a place necessarily or a city just to see a collection of shows. The shows go to those cities and try to tap into those, that the audience is there. Um, that makes and we sense. have obviously, we obviously have big, and so the bigger number of cities, you know, like Melbourne at the moment has Harry Potter and that's the Australian Harry Potter. Yeah. And so people flock there and, you know, come from away, just did a, a really long season. I believe it was in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and now it's going to Sydney. So yeah, it's, um, we love musicals here. We love them, but we, we have, <coughs> excuse me. Um, we have a, uh, a different framework, I guess. Some of the people that you, you, um, that come out of Australia, you know, the Beetlejuices and um, the King Kongs. Any other any other shows you've seen that come out of Australia that that you've been impressed with? Oh gosh, I mean, it's um, yeah, there are the the Eddie Perfect and um, and Tim Minchin are certainly the two guys that are really, you know, at the top of our game at the moment because they are having such unprecedented success. Um, and that is probably, like I was alluding to before, built upon, you know, lots of other works that may not have been able to get out of Australia that kind of developed here. Mm -hmm. I mean, a couple that just come to mind that were hits over there is obviously The Boy From Oz, which was the... Yes. <coughs> Sorry, I might need to stop and grab a drink of water just to stop coughing in all of your listening ears, but... I'll see. Um, Boy From Oz written by, you know, I think it was Nick Enright that did the original one that was then redeveloped um, for the Broadway one that was yeah. with someone you probably heard of, Hugh Jackman. Yeah, I, th I think I've heard of him, maybe. So Brand New Day um, uh, is one of the shows that comes to mind. Um, written by Jimmy Chu, Jimmy Chi. Um, I don't know how to pronounce his last name correctly, actually. So apologies, <laughs> Jimmy, for that. I've never really said his name out loud and the music and lyrics by Knuckles as well. These are uh, indigenous Australians and this oh, okay. show was written in, in 1990. And um, 
there's a really, it's a tremendous film. There's recordings, there's been a film. Uh, and that was kind of a landmark piece. Uh, the Sapphires is another one that was turned into the film that was created over in Australia here. Right. Um, yeah, so writers like Craig Christie, who I know has been on the show, yep. Matthew Dr. Robinson. Craig. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, uh, really passionate people. Tyron Park, uh, Neil Gooding's a producer that's Australian. Yep. It's been, there's so many people. You know, and and I wish we could get more of, them, <laughs> of these shows over here because, again, you're naming stuff I've never heard of, and I would love to hear them. And and, and that was my I mean, goal, starting with the radio station too, to introduce the the rest of the world to all of these shows that you just might not know yet. I mean, yeah, and I haven't even mentioned like Nick Enright, who's kind of you know someone that was really a big part of developing a lot mm. of people's understanding of the dramatic principles. And that's been one of the big things I think for Australia over the last 50 years in kind of getting to then be able to create things that compete in the global market, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're so far away from, this is just my opinion. This is yeah. something that I've kind of been thinking a lot about, but we've been so far away from the source material of American theater, like just the dramatic principles of American theater of the American drama, which was a big, had played a big part in obviously how musicals were created. Yeah. But then also of European music, of American folk music, we also don't have that tradition. Mm -hmm. So we then also don't have the, the tradition of, of, Amer of, of dance in the same way. So they're the three very fundamental art forms that were then used to create this American art form. Yeah. We actually didn't really understand how to do it the very, in the core sense either. So I think we've then had to develop our core sense understanding of those three things to then be able to then put them together. That's just my total uh, hypothesis and, 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 and theory on things. No, I, um, I totally agree. It probably is true. Um, because when you have that type of divide um, and ex access, you know, you're not, you're going to develop it in your own way. The same thing here happened here in Canada, even though we are really close to uh, uh, the States and New York, we, we created a whole different, you know, way to do things like i went to this thing at my old alma mater at sheridan college that developed come from away and they were doing a three so three show um what is it uh, just a sample of the three different shows one was from england one was from canada and one was from the u.s and after watching all three you could see the the difference in the way they were written and the way they they come across where you know the english was a bit weirder <laughs> canadians was a little i didn't know how to describe it it was it was what was the show again it was called hoarders so every everybody on stage was a piece of inanimate object like a chair or a desk or something in the hoarder's house um and then can, can the canadian was a little bit more intimate and the final one was uh pump up the volume uh, the musical based on the movie yeah. and and that's big and, and, and rock and, and and it's just interesting well, like where do you think australia falls in, in that sort of thing this is a really really interesting and fun thing to 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 talk about it's something that i am so interested in so thanks for asking that question no and even just sort of taking the conversation here because um, so this podcast that I've been working on, uh, it's loosely called making musicals at the moment. Right. Mm -hmm. So I went to New York, uh, last year or the year before, and I spent 10 days unplanned. Yeah. And so what I did was I had interviews with all these different people and I tried to understand how to make a great musical. So the show's kind of been a development for about 16 months now. It's this big kind of documentary audio piece that we've cool. interviews and live sound and sort of thing. So, but through that, I had a, uh, a conversation with Adam Gettle, right? Yep. And he was talking about, he believed, and I said this, do you think Australia can make a great musical? And this was kind of before our Muriel's wedding, which is um, coming over to you guys soon. And this was, yes, I'm waiting for that. you know, we'd had Matilda, but that Matilda's a British musical at its heart with kind of yeah. the music being kind of, you know, very Australian in that kind of idiom. And, and mm -hmm. you know, our jokey sense of humor or whatever. Um, I mean, these are all very blanket statements. You know what I mean? Like that <laughs> yeah. rug is purple. You know, like it is because I say so. Um, but uh, it's blue, Brad. Whatever. Um, but he said, uh, just sort of summarizing what was this beautifully eloquent and very well thought and intelligent sort of phrase. He said that he believed that the musical will develop and be true to wherever it is 
who, by whomever creates it. And, it. and it will be true because it is by those people. Now that's yeah. not exactly what he was saying. He said it in a much better way. I might even try and <laughs> uh, send you a bit of the transcripts he included in the notes so people can actually see what he said. But mm. it, it, what he was saying basically is that you don't have to try and write an American musical if you're not American, mm -hmm. because just look at the British tradition. What they did was they changed the art form. They changed it. Yeah. by creating the spectacle, you know, these, these, these musicals that had spectacle and were big and all those sort of things. So I, he was saying that if you're true to kind of where you're from and your origins and your people and, and, and what it is you feel you have to say, and then if you take those principles and you condense the form through those principles, metaphor, you know, uh, symbolism, all these things, ritual, all the things that we do on stage, by doing that, you will create something unique that will then speak through the medium of musical theatre. And I mean, that's a really kind of wanky way I've just said of yeah. saying you'll make a good musical <laughs> yeah. that will be unique. Um, so I guess to answer your question uh, <laughs> is that I think I don't know what Australian musicals are. Um, yeah. If I if I look at the ones that we've had that are most successful so far, if you look at Boy From Oz, and, and I haven't done any research for this conversation about this right now, so I'm yeah. just kind of talking off the top of my oh, head. Oh, for sure. It, from memory, Boy From Oz is, is, is very funny, the original, um, but very... Uh, it'd be interesting to look at how the book forms in all of these different shows and how, how traditional they are in, 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 in a sense and how unique that is. And then, you know, you look at the music of, of Matilda, it's got a very, you know, unique sound. Tim Minchin sounds like Tim Minchin. He's definitely mm -hmm. not trying to sound like anyone else. You know, there's influences. You know? Yeah, for sure. Eddie Perfect sounds like Eddie Perfect, you know, although again, Beetlejuice has, it's, it's definitely um, replicating a, a vibe at times, you know, and trying to, to live in a world as all great writers do. Yeah. Um, people always talk about the Australian sense of humor. So I guess that's something, you know, even, you know, in talking to me today, we love to laugh. We love to make silly sure. jokes. We, yeah. we love to kind of hang ourselves out on the clothesline and say, look how foolish I am, <laughs> you know, look yeah. at me, you know, flapping in the wind. Um, so that's definitely something that's there. Um, but I, I think we, we still have a bit of a, I think we still have a bit of a, a complex in a, in a sense that I think in a few years, maybe once we've had a longer run of, of various artists, you know, mm -hmm. um, and kind of a, a, a stronger fabric of kind of the tradition and have maybe forged a way like the British have in kind of having, yeah. you know, a flag to claim, we probably will be able to know what the answer to that is because we will see a wider spectrum. Um, yeah, and at the moment we're still, I guess, trying to find it. I think. I think Australian, Australia, and and Canada are very similar. I think if you just look at the history of them, you've got yeah. the big mom, uh, uh, the UK, and you've got that rebellious brother <laughs> in yeah. the US, and and the yeah. two of us are like, um, okay, we kind of we separated from mom and dad and went our own <laughs> way. We didn't really rebel, but you know we. We, we carved out a niche of ourselves, but uh, we still reflective of how our parents are. Um, I joke that um, what you know, the Americans took to arms, and the Australians took a slightly different approach. Was just we turned off the light and pretended we weren't home, and that is how we <laughs> dealt with the British. <laughs> it's kind of, <laughs> and I don't know if that's what Canada did, but it's kind of like we're like you, you don't exist. We don't have to talk to you. It's like that next door neighbor you never actually recognize, but they never leave. You know. So we still, you know, we still have the queen, but we don't talk about it. You know? yeah. I think we're too close a neighbor to England to, to hide too much. We couldn't turn off the light. They're like right beside us. They can just look over and go, Candy, you're still there. Know <laughs> yeah, you're that's there. Right. We know yeah, the lights right. we are off. a large mass of water. Yeah, you guys are across <laughs> the water. They're like, oh, oh yeah, the kids. Well, they'll, they'll did be you fine. get that tea we sent you? <laughs> exactly. Yes, we did. <laughs> Burn it. Yeah, they... <laughs> They visit you once in a while. They they know you're still there, but uh, they can see us. And then we got the loud neighbors. So that's right. Here, but uh, yeah, I, I think we're we're pretty close. Uh, I think in uh, if, if I can think correctly, you know, I'm thinking about to the boy from from Oz, and uh, you guys put on um, Priscilla, right? Priscilla. Oh, we did. Of course, there. I yeah. totally. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up because yeah. I would have felt really, really terrible to forget. I'm that. going to yeah, see that's... Priscilla again in Chicago in March. I'm looking forward to seeing that. I loved seeing it the first time. It was so much fun. 
And when did you see it the first time? Because I think I underestimate what a huge global phenomenon Priscilla is. Like, I think in Australia, we kind of forget what a huge... Yeah, it must have been about 10 years ago. I'm trying to remember uh, when it came through Toronto. Uh, Yeah, Because it was, I mean, this, you know, Priscilla was also um, pre-Kinky Boots. Yes. You know, so it was definitely... um, Oh, it was fun. But but yeah, I think it's more character driven too. Uh, I think the boys from Oz is quite character driven because because it's about him. Um, Priscilla is very it's spectacle. <laughs> the hell yeah, it's spectacle. But you know, you got these three characters, and and I think that's more. I don't know. I could be wrong too. Somebody no, will no, that's me def- at some point. No, I think that's true. It is. You know, you the the boy from Oz follows Peter Allen's journey, and yeah. and, and Priscilla follows these three. Um, characters yeah yeah it's probably a good way to put it oh, well so so what what what's the future looking like obviously for you in in the way you're writing we got we've got uh bill you've got the podcast uh looking forward to that do you have a timeline for that we're just we're sort of shopping it around at the moment it's kind of it's we've got a lot of stuff ready to go out and hopefully we'll have things to share and and i'll definitely come back and Maybe we can talk about that, you know, For particularly sure. once it's, once it's live. Um, it's, it's been such a huge project that we just needed to get it out. We're going to put it out independently, but it's, it's been, it's, it's been huge. It's 16 months of kind of um, yeah. producing something as if we were a major kind of channel, you know, like we were kind of a major um, distributor. It's been huge, you know? Wow. Um, yeah. That. Cause it weaves like sound that, that I took from on the streets and then these interviews and every, every episode has a narrative to it as I go about my day there. Cause I only had 10 days in the city. So yeah. we ended up getting something like 30 interviews across 10 days. So you can imagine by the end and I'd never planned an interview before I arrived. <laughs> so you watch it all unfold in sort of, you listen to it in real time as yeah. I then reach more people and, and kind of try to answer this question, which is, should I give up this job essentially, or should I keep going, you know, so far away wow from the from the heart from the motherland you know how, how did you get a hold of the people did well you just i just up, kind or? of i just yeah i called i emailed i i uh utilized some networks that i had um i i mean it was a real balance um as you will know you know you know running mtr and and, and the podcast and all sort of things yeah. and then anyone that that does something similar you only have so many hours that you can actually do <laughs> so you kind of have to well, I can only do, you know, you can only memorize so much and then you can only reach out to so many people because you then have that interview. So you have to be ready for that interview. And then after that, so in the beginning, I just kind of did a blanket email to, to, to a lot of people and then narrowed it down and then followed up with some, let some go. Um, and that was part of the the uniqueness of 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 what I feel the show is is because it is we ended up with the people that really wanted to talk to us, and everyone has something really interesting to talk about. So, some people we, we uh, some unique ones. We ended up speaking to um, some teachers from Steinhardt and from NYU, and they all had really interesting perspectives to talk about specific parts of um, of of training and about New York and about, you know, the development of the craft. We, Mm -hmm. we spoke to some really prominent people from different award-winning musicals, some different Tony winning shows. We spoke to, um, to someone from Playbill. We spoke just a whole bunch of people that we were able to secure from some marketing agencies, um, to new writers, to established ones. It was, um, to, 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 to people on the street. It was kind of, you know, I even interviewed um, the the Naked Cowboy. You know the oh, Naked yeah. Cowboy? Yeah. So I went up to the Naked Cowboy. For anyone that doesn't know, in Times Square, <laughs> um, I arrived and, and um, so this one, there's this one episode that's about, it, I don't know what it's called at the moment because we haven't completely, you know, sent it into the can, but yeah. um, it's about the subway. And it's about how so much happens on the subway and me traveling and, on one particular time when I was traveling through this band was busking in the middle of, I mean, if you've been to the city, you know that there is so much art even on the subway. Oh yeah, for sure. And one of the bigger questions in the piece is about what does the city do to create this art and how much of the city is responsible for it by the sheer engine of the city. And that's why, you know, when so many of us go to the city, we have this kind of experience, you know, we have this, I'm in New York, 
Um, and so part of one of the questions, there was many questions that I tried to sort of ask and tried to let these people that I talked to answer was, is, can you recreate this anywhere else? Or do you need to come here to be a part of this? Is that just one of the simple things we all need to accept at some point? So when I was kind of on this train and I heard this band busking, these two guys playing uh, guitar and uh, playing guitar and drums, I kind of listened to it. And, and in the podcast, you hear the doors open and you hear the sound waft through as I'm talking to someone on the train mm -hmm. and uh, on the subway, sorry, trains very Australian. Um, and and then so then the doors close and you hear me uh, in the in the in the live audio you know say oh man that's grooving and he goes <laughs> yeah yeah that's cool and so then the, the the subway pulls away to the next stop and then i go you know what i think i'm going to get off and go back and talk to him and so i get off and i'm stumbling and i'd only been in new york for like a day <laughs> i'd only been there once before i have no idea where i'm going yeah my phone is recording all my audio. So I'm not even really using any Google map. And because I've got an Australian <laughs> SIM, I don't even want to use it because it cost me like a million dollars. Yeah. And I'm already doing this project on no money anyway, you know? <laughs> so I get up, I'm lost trying to find the right train to go back a station. I think I end up going too far and I'm coming back. I end up finally tracking these guys down. I walk up as they're playing the song and it's like, you know, Oh, hey guys, you know, I'm this guy from Australia. I'm doing this podcast about the city. Do you mind talking to me? Yeah, man. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. And so they tell me this story about how, you know, one of the guys I believe from memory was from Mexico and he traveled to the city just to, to make music and talked about the energy of the city and what he loved about it. And, and, um, and it was really inspiring because, you know, they were living kind of their dream, but the, the dream that they were living was maybe not the one that, we would, we would kind of accept to be living the dream, mm -hmm. you know, and it's always great to hear someone talk about that. It's the same thing we were talking about before about just even completing a draft is kind of a success when we lose that, you know? Yeah. And so when I talked to the naked cowboy, I kind of, it was the same thing. I wanted to know who this guy was, you know, this guy that stands in times square, he's got, you know, for anyone that doesn't know, he's got this pair of sparkly white underpants. He's very toned, very fit, very tall, um, got a cowboy hat and he sits there playing these, this guitar and say, like, I'm the naked cowboy and we're going to refall <laughs> year. That's a terrible American accent. I mean, no uh, insult to anyone. <laughs> I just lost some listeners, but I'll, I'll deal with it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it, yeah, he, he pretty much just said, he spoke to me for a couple of minutes and, and uh, I mean, to be honest, I don't think he kind of really, answered any major questions that are going to really help any writers struggling away <laughs> in their bedrooms. But he was a great chat, you know? <laughs> was there anybody that, and I don't, if you can't answer it, you can't answer it. Was there anybody yeah, sure. that surprised you that said yes to, to the being interviewed that you were like, Oh, I don't think I'll ever get this person. But, oh, I got it. Um, I kind of want to let that unfold because I don't want to okay. give away who we, who we get. Um, Can we say who that's... you didn't get? <laughs> <laughs> you want to narrow it down from that way? Yeah, from, um, from the I mean, 10 million people in New York, who didn't you get? <laughs> like, um, all right, well, let's start did. with Barry from the, from the flower shop in Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he spoke to us and that's how I know him. Nice. Uh, no, there's, look, there's a lot of people that we didn't get. Um, yeah. But part of what's about the show's elegance, if I can choose a word that's probably totally not the right one to talk about your own show, <laughs> with, is that the people talk about something they're passionate about, every yeah. person, and that's what makes the, the episode so interesting. So um, uh, who can I just pick as a random one? There's someone that you might not have think would be the person from that you'd want to talk to, but then their story was really, really revealing. Um, Well, this is great audio. Uh, <laughs> let me just say that you can, there's, there's the, you can follow, just follow me on social media and, okay. and we'll, we'll have news about it soon. I, I, let, let me tell you as one, the guy from, so we spoke to the Sardis. I'd known about Sardis for a yeah. long time. Sardis is where the, the caricatures go up on the walls. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I wanted to, I was exploring in that episode, I explore this idea of celebrity and how much of celebrity is an important part of making musicals and how much it kind of is a part of the business and this place that hangs, you know, it's this unofficial hall of fame <coughs> hearing the story of how that came about was so interesting. And the owner, I turned up one day and the owner came down and spoke to me for 40 minutes, wow. just sat down. He gave me um, this beautiful book 
of this published book that Asadi's book about um, the caricatures that they've done through the history of time. I mean, he didn't have to come down and, and sit with me. He didn't, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, you know, there's no one from Australia yeah. and he's kind of just come down because he's proud. And, and this is the biggest thing that I found is that so many people are proud of, of the art form over there that they, they, they want to pass on the information. And I think that's one of the biggest things that other places can learn is that, we all need to continue to support each other and to lift each other up and share what we know, because if the industry gets better and if everyone makes things mm-hmm. better, then the overall products will be better from each particular place. And that is kind of the key, I think. For sure. That's very cool. This podcast sounds really great and I can't wait for it to come out and, and give it a listen. So yeah. Well, thank you. I can't wait to share it. I'll, yeah. uh, I'll send you a, I might send you a little preview. Hey, I'll oh, send you one just a, that would be cool. And and as soon as it's ready, I will I have a spot on our website that says Podcasts of Friends. I will put it there as a link so people can go listen to it and I'll promote it on the station for sure. So Amazing. Uh, I so appreciate that. Thank you. That's very awesome. Generous. So uh, thank you, Brad, so much for coming on and, and, and talking to me today about everything, uh, but your career, Australian musical theater. But before I go, and you already know this because you've listened to previous podcasts, I yeah, asked three I questions. Right? Yeah, okay. Are you ready for the three questions? Uh, sorry, I just lost you there. Um, oh, so you? you've got... No, I'm joking. Yeah, yeah. I'm ready for them. Jump on. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready for them. Unfortunately, yeah, you are ready for them. That's the problem. Uh, I'm going to have to come up with new ones next time. Um, well, maybe right. not. Uh, we'll see if you're ready. So three right. questions I always ask. There's no right or wrong answer, but there is a wrong answer. You probably yeah. know what it is already. So yeah. now I'm curious whether you'll give me the right answer for that. All right. So question number one, Sondheim or Weber? So as a quick backstory, when I was uh, in high school, we had to do an opinion piece Mm -hmm. and the opinion piece had to be something well thought out. It had to be articulate. It had to be something that dealt with a big issue in society, right? This is for English. And so I chose to write a a piece that was uh, eloquently called Sondheim versus Andrew Lloyd Weber, who is better. (laughs) Swear hand to God, hand to God. And to be honest, my English teacher probably didn't know who who either of those people were. (laughs) And beyond that, it also wasn't very articulate because at the time, (laughs) my whole argument, and I swear to God, I've got this saved somewhere. It's so embarrassing was, was Sondheim is cleverer. So he is betterer or something like that. Like it was so stupid. It was so stupid. But now I bring this up because I, my, my answer to this question is Andrew Lloyd Webber. Okay. Mm-hmm. This is my answer. Yep. And this is, be, this is because, and it's possibly wrong. It was the first, uh, he, he is the one that got me into musical theater. I listened to his records before anybody else. And like I said to you earlier, is that I, I don't think there's anything wrong with kind of something being less, uh, something can be refined, but still palatable to a larger, larger group of people, mm-hmm. for lack of a better word. A lot of yep. people love Sondheim. I'm not saying it doesn't appeal, but writing something that has a more of a mass appeal, you can still succeed in that to the same relevance as writing something that's really, really, really refined and like a beautiful piece of diamond. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, so for me, I would listen to, and oh my God, this will probably, I'll be embarrassed uh, <laughs> for people to know, but not, not in that way. Cause I love Andrew Lloyd Webber's music and I love Stephen sometimes music. Yeah. But I, I, uh, uh, my answer, final answer, lock it in is uh, Jason Robert Brown. No, is Andrew Lloyd Webber. Oh, close. <laughs> that, and, that's, and that's why I never say who's better or anything. I just say Weber or Sondheim. Yeah. Because you gave the, you know, you gave the correct answer. He was more important to you getting into things and, and that sort of thing. That doesn't make him better or worse, just different or more important to you. So it, there is no, for the Sondheim Weber, there's no right or wrong answer. So that's- It's interesting though that I was a little bit on the back foot anyway. And this is interesting about, about sort of us, uh, musical nerds too, isn't it? Is we kind of in some way feel that you need to be kind of, you know, like the more deeply intelligent things. Not yeah. that, but look at Andrew Lloyd Webber's shows and the ones with Hal Prince, Hal Prince, they are incredibly intelligent. Oh yeah. Incredibly intelligent. If you could never, if you could write anything that good and, and you know, make a couple yeah. of dollars while you're doing it, you'll be doing pretty well. So exactly. And, and they don't even like one writes lyrics and music. One writes just music. Like you, you really can't compare them. 
They are it's, so completely it's, different. You know what? So if I could go back to that kind of young teenager who wrote yeah. his article at Sondheim versus <laughs> Andrew Lerma, who is better, I wish he could see me now. I really do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Question number two. Mm -hmm. What is the one thing from the future that is going to surprise the rest of us that you've oh, already you experienced? Oh, you switched them up. You switched oh. up the question, Sean Paul. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, he's thinking on his feet. Um, what is the one thing that's going to surprise you from the future? Yeah, since you are from the future. What's uh, going to happen well, in I 15 guess... hours? Because <laughs> that's how far well, What's going to surprise you is that I knew the three questions that you would usually ask to surprise people. So that's yeah. going to surprise you in 15 hours when you talk wow. to me for this podcast. It's true. <laughs> uh, but what's going to surprise you is that I'm still going to answer what you usually ask as your second question because I have a ridiculously good answer. <laughs> Wait, you normally what? ask. Wait, what you is normally my... ask. Yeah, what is it? I don't remember. From from what from from well, what you, I've heard you ask a, a couple of people at least yeah. is what is the most embarrassing thing or good thing that's happened to you on stage? Is that oh true? I, I I forgot I see what I okay just to take it back I I used to do five questions I've trimmed it down to three and okay, then what I do I've is I only heard the three ones okay yeah the first bunch of them were five questions but then I changed the middle one always depending on who I'm talking to okay 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 oh, all right so. well. What is well, the most embarrassing thing that's happened to you on stage or weirdest? Well, I was uh, on a cruise ship doing a show in one of the big theaters and I was playing the intro to Hey Jude mm -hmm. and, uh, and um, I felt some sort of black fabric hit me in the face. <laughs> and, um, and so I looked up and it was kind of this kind of synthetic kind of thing. And I picked it up and I turned it to the audience and it was a black pair of underpants. <laughs> <laughs> and what's amazing is obviously the clientele on these, uh, large naval vessels are not always maybe the younger ideal. Uh, I wouldn't say ideal, but they're, they're, look, they're generally older people. Yes. And, and so when I said to the audience who threw these <laughs> in the middle of a show with at least a thousand people, a lady's voice up the back said, I did. And I said, what? she was right up the back. Well, she, she'd run down to the front and then she'd oh, obviously okay. run to the back of the theater while I was sort of doing the interlude thing. Yeah. And she said, I did. My name's Maureen. I said, Maureen, why would you throw these underpants? And she said, I've never done anything like this before. I'm 82 <laughs> years old. <laughs> 82 <laughs> years old. <laughs> and so I sort of said, oh, well, that's really nice. And this is a hundred percent true story. I saw her after the show, I went up, she was so proud because I think she'd never done anything so crazy. And it was a yeah. big joke because I used to do this bit earlier in the show. There's this big sort of comedy bit where I joke about everyone jumping their feet and ripping their clothes off. And it's, it's really silly because obviously, yeah. every, obviously people can't even get to their feet on the cruise ships because they are sort of elderly. So they find it funny. Um, and so later she, when she was telling me about it, she was lovely. She let me keep the underpants, which was nice. <laughs> Did um, you frame them? I'm wearing them now. Nice. Um, no, I'm not. Obviously not. No. Not so I, nice. Don't. That's not very nice to the audience. They just pictured you in it. And they were excited. And now, <laughs> now on your dating profile, you've just lost people. You might as uh, well just throw the ducks great. out the window. <laughs> so. Oh, gosh. Well, thanks for indulging me. I was ready to crack that one out. That was the one bit of prep I did. I was ready to tell that story. <laughs> Well, I'm glad. So you, you're getting three and a half questions, four questions. So you're, you're special. Perfect. Awesome. And the final question, the most important question, you probably already know what it is. Audience members eating food in the theater. Yes or no? Oh gosh. I don't know how to answer this one, John Paul. Um, look, I enjoy taking food into the movies. Mm -hmm. I don't take food into the theater, but mm -hmm. I do like to take a beverage. I do like to take a beer or something like that. Okay. Um, so I'm, oh gosh, I'm going to say, uh, drinks, but no food. Am I'm, I allowed to say that? You can say whatever you want, whether it's okay, right or okay. wrong. It's a whole different story. <laughs> so, What's your argument here? No, I, I always, no? I always say no food or drink. Now the reasoning is a, I hate it because it's noisy. Food's the worst. If I'm on stage, I don't want to hear it. I want to hear people of drinking. Course. But the second reason is people leave their garbage all over the floor. Like you will, the lights will come up and you'll see cups and bags and just garbage everywhere. And it just makes me angry. Yeah, I don't think about that. Yeah. Every time I go to a show, I take a picture of all the garbage and post it online. 
not that it's going to do anything, but I just like to remind. Well, people, it might. I it. mean, uh, I mean, this does open up another thing about how we all probably need to clean up over after ourselves a bit more, yeah. which is uh, it's probably <laughs> uh, yeah. a lovely way to segue into the end of the show. So we can uh, <laughs> open that discussion now for anyone else that wants to listen to it in, uh, on the next episode. Exactly. I guess. <laughs> We're going to do a whole episode on geography and eco um, ecology. So I thought you were about to say Ecolo. <laughs> we're saving that for a little bit down the road um but uh, so yeah i i just think no food or drink in the theater but uh it's going yeah, i respect the that direction. i respect that i mean i'm only trying to keep it there because i enjoy like i said a, yeah. a beer or a wine or something so but it, it's you're right you're right i can't argue with your your principles are true i yeah. can't argue with you and you're probably used to people drinking or, or partaking in something, being on the cruise ship in front of all these people. Now, is it is it cocktail seating for you or is it theater seating? Uh, it depends. It's it's the smaller ones definitely are more of like a cabaret kind of venue. Mm. Like so, if for example, uh, look, people probably won't be familiar with all the different cruise lines. But so, for example, I make this joke that our agency, my agent, would you know he'll have me playing anywhere he can get me. So if he could get me a gig on a, on a little dinghy in Vietnam, I would be there playing a show. Right. Yeah. So some of the venues are, are quite small, but it's still the headline space. And then sometimes you've got thousand seater kind of uh, traditional theaters. So yeah. you've got to be ready for all kind of different, different things. And you're right. There are some people that are often quite intoxic intoxicated. And then you've got some people that are sipping while you're talking and you, you've got all, it's a great, uh, it's a great, training ground you yeah. know it's, it's very old school which yes. i love because <laughs> yeah that's what i love about theater it's, it's live anything can happen anywhere you can get panties thrown at you like whatever <laughs> happens like i'm waiting for the day that happens to me i just wish oh well do you do you really i do it would be awesome <laughs> and you have an incredible story like it, it is it actually takes <laughs> up so it, I, I do yeah it's a it's a great bit that i have in my pocket it's like a five minute you know exactly. bit that i can go to it's a great story <laughs> you're right awesome. you answered all three questions three and a half four questions I, i'm gonna say you got at least three and a half out of four okay you did right. good. Uh, so okay, good. Yeah, that's a that's a passing grade you know, probably Does a that little mean bit. You actually publish the episode. If you don't get over the, the correct amount, you just don't publish the show. Well, only, only if you can send me that Sondheim versus Weber essay that you wrote, because I'd love to share that with everybody <laughs> as well. <laughs> oh God. Oh God. I can't believe I told you that story. <laughs> <laughs> and now you have told everyone. So yeah, right. it's out there forever. <laughs> hey, when, when Andrew and Steven are listening, they'll, they'll, they'll compliment you. They'll, they'll let yeah, you. I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again so much, Brad, for coming on and, and talking to us and telling us about everything. And um, you'll definitely let us know when the podcast comes because we'll let everybody else know as well. Yeah, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks for having me on to, to for all the wide things we talked about. I really enjoyed it. And I, I hope, you know, people enjoyed it too. It was, it was a lot of fun. And if they didn't, it's too late now. They've listened. So that's right. That's right. <laughs> well, Jokes on you. Exactly. <laughs> All right, everybody. That was uh, Brad McCaw here on Musical Theater Radio's Be Our Guest. Come back next week when we'll have a new guest or guest talking about their life, love, and passion of musical theater. I am your host, as always, Jean-Paul Yovanoff, and I'll see you when I see you. <laughs>